Okay, we're pretty close to 12.30, so I went ahead and uh, started recording the meeting, and uh, there should be some other folks that are should be joining us here uh, uh, pretty quick. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is John Mann, and I am an assistant professor at Michigan State University and the host of this webinar series. It's called Innovations in Agriculture and Rural Development. The series is sponsored by the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, which is also housed here at Michigan State. So I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. The uh, title is Prairie Aquatech, Improving Animal Health, Nutrition, and Production Efficiency. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to take about a, about a minute here, and I just want to point out a few items. So uh, first of all, if you have not done so, please take a moment and answer the poll questions. Looks like we've got a pretty good response based on uh, attendance so far, but uh, please take a moment and answer those. We'd like to keep up with the makeup of our audience. Um, next is about halfway through the presentation, we'll have a, a really short trivia question break. And so we're going to ask you about three questions related to the presentation material up to the up to this point up, or up to that point in the uh, in the presentation. Then uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. So as your uh, questions come up uh, in the chat box below where it says everyone, please uh, please feel free to, to put those in there. And you can do that at any point during the presentation. And we'll get to your questions at the uh, questions and answers at the uh, conclusion. Um, and then uh, when we get done with the Q&A session, uh, I've got three really short poll questions that I hope you'll uh, stick around for that. And then finally, we're going to have a, a couple of screen flashes. So we're going to change the screen a couple of times. And I'm going to go ahead and do that now just to demonstrate. Uh, when I do that, it'll take a minute to set up. And, um, and so this takes us to our main presentation page. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, participating today. Um, and now, uh, Dr. Bill Gibbons and Dr. Mike Brown, who are from uh, South Dakota State University uh, and Prairie Aquatech, as well as uh, Mary Beth Fishback. She's the uh, Director of Operations at Innovation Partners uh, Prairie Aquatech. They're going to tell us more about their efforts to improve animal health, nutrition, and production efficiency in aquaculture. So uh, go ahead and uh, take it away, whoever wants to start. John, thank you for that introduction. Uh, good morning. Again, this is Mary Beth Fishback. I'm the Director of Operations for Prairie Aquatech. Prairie Aquatech is an animal health and nutrition company focused on upgrading plant-based meals into a high-quality protein for use in aquaculture and other food animal diets. Now, if you'll uh, take a look at this first slide here with our basic process flow, again, we start with plant-based meals, things like soybean meal, dried distiller's grain, canola meal, et cetera, and put them through a uh, biological process that upgrades the protein uh, in those meals. And we end up with a very high quality protein powder that can then be formulated into a, a final feed for aquaculture and, and other food animal diets. To discuss more about the uh, current market challenge and, and on some of our process details, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Mike Brown, who will walk us through the market challenge. The market challenge. Thanks, Mary Beth. Uh, I think probably all the participants can agree, uh, particularly on one item, and that's the uh, you know our human population is not uh, so nascent in terms of numbers. We're currently around 7.3 billion, and by 2050, uh, the projections range from about 8.3 to 10.9 billion, so somewhere around 9.6. And uh, one of the primary uh, components of the human diet has been recognized as being potentially scarce uh, in, you know, in upcoming years is animal protein. And uh, most of my work is, is done with, with fish, and I operate in the fish nutrition realm. And one of the things neat about fish is that they're very efficient at producing protein. Uh, oftentimes we see anywhere between one um, 1 to 1 1.4 uh, feed conversions on, on a lot of our feeds, particularly in intensive culture operations. So fish are highly efficient uh, relative to other food animals. Um, one of the next issues that we see, if fish are um, a good good source of, of animal protein, uh, what about, what about our, our wild capture fisheries? One of the things that we do know is that 
uh, exploitation has increased, particularly with the advent of new technologies that, that ensued after or during and after the 1960s. Uh, we, we pretty much fully exploited, particularly the, the high value fishes uh, that are available in, in the marine environment. And uh, in particular, fully exploited uh, combined with overexploited fishes, we're somewhere around 87% according to recent FAO statistics. Our uh, annual harvest from wild capture fisheries peaked around 85 million tons in the mid 1990s and has, has declined slightly, but it appears to be stabilized somewhere around 80 million tons. Uh, it's clearly not sustainable, uh, particularly thinking about, again, the, the growth of the human population and, and nutritional needs. So thinking about this, um, aquaculture, that is uh, commercial production of fishes for human consumption, uh, has, has grown fairly tremendously over the last couple of decades, most recently here at about, about 9% annually and is currently supplying over 40% of the, the market demand uh, for fishes. So it's, it's getting very close to uh, the level that's, that's produced by the wild captured fisheries. One of the issues that we have seen uh, over the last few decades is the, the use of fish meal as a primary protein constituent in fish feeds, aquafeeds, and has it, as a consequence, it's become very costly. Um, we use quite a bit of fish meal, or have traditionally used a lot of fish meal in fish diets, particularly carnivorous species, uh, simply because it meets the nutrient requirements, particularly protein and amino acid requirements of fish. So uh, that, and in competition with other animal production industries, such as swine and poultry, which use uh, some fish meal, not as much as we do in, in aquaculture, creates uh, you know, a supply and demand issue. Uh, in particular, if we think about you know, CapEx and OpEx, particularly the OpEx side of operating a, a commercial aquaculture business, feed costs can be fairly high, as much as 40 to 70 percent of, of annual production costs. So, and again, thinking back, the, the fish meal is the, the primary driver that's uh, pushing those fish meal or fish feed uh, prices up. One of the things that we noted, uh, you know, fish meal production itself, and we've seen some recent information from uh, South America. They're having some issues, the uh, Peruvian anchovy, and a little bit on the Chilean horse mackerel. Uh, some of the primary fish meals produced down there is that uh, fish meal production is declining. Well, if you have declining production or supply, then obviously you have the increased prices. And what that leads to is uh, uh, a price point that some days, depending on which, when you look at the commodity market, uh, you know, we're over $2,000 per ton. And that, that is really a, a major hindrance to uh, commercial fish production. So moving into to the area that, that Prairie Aquatech is involved in, um, we were applying some, some novel approaches to enhance or improve plant-based proteins as simple protein replacers for fish meal. And uh, some of the products that we've been working with or commodities that we've been working with is soybean meals, white flake, soy, uh, and it have, have developed some soy protein concentrates. Um, distillers grains, dry distillers grains, distillers grains with solubles, and more recently canola meals. If we look at, uh, in particular, soybean meal and the levels that can be re used to replace fish meal in fish diets, we, we've seen you know some success up to almost 50 percent, 20 to 50 percent, but. What we found is that you know the higher value fishes, uh, typically we can't really push that 20% level. They just simply cannot tolerate the oligosaccharides and, and high fiber uh, found in in, in uh, soybean meal. So the, these types of things 
along with uh, any nutritional factors such as trypsin inhibitors, uh, kind of limit how much we can include in the feed. This is a pretty good graphic, I think, that demonstrates what's been happening long term, at least back to the early 2000s in terms of pricing for uh, fish meal versus the, the primary commodity that we're talking about here, soybean meal. And you see the, the, that the fish meal does definitely have a, uh, an increasing trajectory there. That uh, in, in combination with thinking about issues such as exploitation or over-exploitation of marine drive uh, fish meal uh, is, is clearly not, not, not a sustainable uh, way to do business. And look at soybean meal. Uh, it, it's fairly flat in, in comparison. So with that, I think, Bill, were you going to talk about the process a little bit? Yep, I'll take it over here. Um, yep, thanks, over. Mike, for the setup, and, and thanks, John, for inviting us to participate today. Uh, Mike mentioned a little bit about our conversion process, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail. We are using a, a, a series of fungi, actually. We have about half a dozen different species, genera and species of fungi that we've used in our process. These are all what you would uh, consider uh, generally recognized as safe, so they're either currently used or uh, have been approved for use in feeds, and in some cases even hu human foods. So uh, that's one of the, the targets that we, we look for is very safe fungi. The other target we look for are organisms that are efficient at breaking down fibers and oligosaccharides into simple sugars and then converting those into to cell mass, and ideally a cell mass that contains a fairly high protein level um, and moreover that contains some of the limiting amino acids uh, that we typically find in soybean meal, some of the high sulfur amino acids. Um, we also look for organisms that are able to degrade some of the other anti-nutritional factors uh, in these feeds, as Mike mentioned, one of them being trypsin inhibitors in soybean meal, uh, in canola meal and some other mustard meals that we're looking at. Uh, the compound there that's of most interest are glucosinolates, and so we, we screen our organisms uh, uh, so they can break those compounds down. We also look at, at phytic acid, uh, ability to degrade phytic acid. Um, so our process is, is uh, those of you that know a little bit about dry mill corn ethanol production, um, somewhat similar to that. It's a pretty straightforward process. Uh, it's an aerobic process as opposed to a an anaerobic ethanol fermentation, but uh, really that's the only the only major difference. We do a little bit different pretreatments on the front end of the process, but then basically do either a submerged or a solid state cultivation of our organisms uh, or mixtures of organisms on these feedstocks, depending upon the feedstock and, and the target species we want to feed the product to. We start our work at, at the shake flask level, as you can see in the next slide here move that up then into five liter bioreactors where we can actively aerate the culture and maintain conditions uh, on a little more stable basis for, for pH and those factors. Uh, at the end of the process we dry the material or we centrifuge and then dry the material um, or just dry the material in the case of the solid phase process and come out with, uh, with a solid product. Uh, shows you in the middle of this diagram a uh, couple of our, our products from uh, canola, for example, um, hexane extracted and some cold pressed canola that we did we did trials with. We've uh, scaled the process now, uh, as seen in this next slide, to uh, one to, to two ton a day capacity in a, a facility that uh, we just are kind of finishing up moving into. Uh, our, our community that we're in here uh, constructed a 30,000 square foot uh, pilot scale facility to transition university research uh, to commercial scale, and we're the first tenant. And so we've been working in several buildings around uh, around town uh, over the past year and a half, and have, uh, just recently now we're moving into this new facility. On the left-hand side, you can see the actual production side of the the operation: uh, mi uh, a grain bin with hammer mill on the uh, lower right-hand corner. 
Uh, we run it through a cooking tank. Uh, you can see the red auger lifting up into that, and then some bioreactors, uh, the bigger tanks that you see kind of in the background up on the, the upper uh, right-hand side, and then centrifuges and some storage tanks and, and drying systems behind that that you can't really see. The left-hand side of the, or the right-hand side of the, the slide here shows our feed manufacturing system. So once we come out of our microbial process and produce our product, it's a dried product, and then that is mixed with other ingredients that would then be formulated into the final fish pellets, and that's what is done on the right-hand side. We have a, an extrusion system, a dryer for the extruded pellets, a vacuum coater if we need to put additional oil on it, and so that is uh, that's set up there, and I, I believe that's probably about a, oh, a ton a day facility as well. I'm not exactly sure on that side. We're just getting it ramped up uh, to speed right now. Mike could probably tell you the, the inside story on that. The other half of this building, we have lab space uh, and analytical uh, and seed train production of our organisms, and then there's a uh, about an 8,000 square foot facility uh, with aquaculture tanks. We have the ability to internally test all of our feeds right on site with uh, both cold water and, and, warm, and warm water species. Again, Mike can tell you a little bit more about that. They're in the process of getting those systems up and running um, as we speak. The, uh, the next slide, just kind of a high level overview of our process. Uh, again, we strive to, uh, to get up to pretty high protein levels with the soybean meal. Uh, to this point, we've achieved about 70% protein on a dry matter basis. We have some other work uh, on, ongoing to try to increase that uh, to even higher levels. Our target is closer to 75% protein. With the distiller's product, we've achieved about 50% protein, same with canola meal. And again, the same types of technologies we're applying to the soybean meal we'll be able to apply to, to these other feedstocks to see if we can boost their protein levels uh, up to closer to 60%. Of course, distiller's grain and, and canola meal start with a lot lower protein levels than, than soybean meal, so um, it's a little bit more of a challenge. But of course, they are less expensive, so that's the advantage on the other side. Mike mentioned uh, anti-nutritional factors that are in these uh, in these feeds or meals, and it, it varies, of course, according to the product we're starting with, but uh, in terms of trypsin inhibitors and glucosinolates, we've been able to get you know up to 95 percent reduction so far, and, and that work is proceeding. Oligosaccharides uh, basically, uh, you know, completely eliminated uh, just a matter of the length of fermentation time. And then fiber, uh, just a little bit of fiber conversion to this point. We're looking at some additional pretreatments and some different combinations of organisms. This is one of the areas we think we have a lot of potential because the more fiber we can convert into cell mass, it concentrates the protein just by re eliminating the fiber, but then you also get that fiber converted into more cell mass, which is more protein. So when we do this microbial conversion, we actually end up getting a, almost a doubling of the increase in protein as opposed to just trying to wash out or separate the fiber and not convert it into additional protein. So those are that's kind of where we're at uh, right now in the process. The uh, um, the process we we seek uh, you know a process that has low energy and water usage, uh, very few if any byproducts or waste materials. Uh, we're doing mass and energy balances on the process, and of course economic analysis as we go, trying to uh, to reduce costs, drive down processing costs. Uh, our advantage, we think, is that uh, you know this is a, a product that is renewable on an annual basis. Uh, large amounts of these feeds are available. We just need to upgrade their nutritional quantity and, and should be able to satisfy that uh, that market for fish uh, as a fish meal replacement. Uh, we've seen a very high protein and amino acid digestibility, as, as Mike will talk about in just a second here. And to protect this, we have, we've have uh, um, through South Dakota Innovation Partners, a, a patent uh, attorney that's helping us develop intellectual property around these, uh, these various organisms and processes and the composition of the final material. So um, very confident in that and have a lot of people interested in, uh, in testing the product. So 
The next slide uh, talks a little bit about some of the work Mike has done. We've also had some feeding trials with outside uh, independent aquaculture producers, and I'll let Mike talk a little bit about that. Just uh, a little bit of background on this slide. Typically what we do first when we're uh, testing a new ingredient, we uh, run a series of palatability and digestibility trials and then following the outcomes of that and the uh, potential for uh, uh, inclusion in, in a, say, a commercial feed, we would go forward and, and, and conduct feeding trials and uh, long-term feeding trials and evaluate some physiological and, and sometimes immunological characteristics of the, the uh, test specimens. On the left of this slide, um, the left chart there, uh, it just kind of gives you an idea of what we've seen relative to uh, digestibility of uh, one of our Gen 2 products. This, this is a soy product here uh, relative to uh, some other commercial products that are on the market uh, in reference to a, a fish meal control, which was in this case uh, uh, Special Select uh, Gulf Men Hayden, 65% uh, protein. And uh, and you can see that the, the Aquatech 2 ingredient uh, had, had a little higher digestibility. And we've done several of these trials, and uh, in yellow perch, we're typically anywhere between uh, nine, somewhere between 93 and 96% on protein digestibility as well as energy digestibility. On the right side gives you uh, one of the outcomes of a growth trial, and this happened to be a soy white flake product that we came out with and uh, you can see that head to head in terms of relative growth it, it matched up very well with with fish meal and in this case we uh, wanted to try it against uh, a, a soy protein concentrate which is about 2200 a ton uh, just just to see how well they performed on it and uh, you know, all indications are this was a 85, 90 day trial and this, this white flake, converted white flake product did, did very well. And, and I might add, this was 100% replacement of fish meal in that, that particular um, trial. Uh, trivia break time, I think. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to yes. pop up a couple of trivia questions here for the uh, audience to answer. So if you'll uh, take a moment, we'll spend about a, a minute or so on these. And these are just for fun, but also to, to see, you know, kind of how, uh, how well our presenters are doing and giving you some of the information. So we've got three questions. Again, please uh, take a minute and fill these out. I'll give you about, uh, about 10 more seconds. Okay, well, uh, not, to, uh, not to give the uh, answers away too much, uh, but it looks like uh, the majority of folks uh, got these right. So. Um, I'm going to move these off the screen, and then I'm going to hand this back over to uh, to our presenters. So thanks for your uh, participation with the trivia questions. Okay, back to you. Okay, I think we will uh, finish up the talk today with some of the business and financial information. This slide is a uh, just basic dis depiction of our financial projections over the next couple of years. Uh, as you can see, it's a, a very simple stepwise approach. Um, Bill touched on our pilot scale operations that are currently going on. Um, 
we're in a, a 30,000 square foot pilot scale facility with production capacity of, of roughly a, a ton per day. This facility allows us to not only continue to optimize some of our current processing conditions, but also produce enough product that we can send out for external feeding trials and validation. As we work in pilot scale operation, we're um, starting to look towards our, our first small commercial plant, which would have a capacity of about 15,000 metric tons annually. And we would look uh, to kind of full construction and oper uh, operation of that first commercial plant into 2015. That plant uh, will actually start uh, generating cash for us with an EBITDA of $8.3 million um, and a capital raise uh, of about $20 million to get that plant operational. Into 2016, we would look to expand into our full large-scale commercial plant, which would be another jump up in production uh, at 150,000 metric ton capacity annually and an EBITDA of about $83 million. Um, again, this is a very stepwise approach. The scale up of our of our process um, is very fairly simple and modular. Once we hit the small commercial plant, adding additional capacity. Uh, will be a matter of, of adding a uh, number of tanks and not necessarily going up so much in size. So we think it's a, a very achievable uh, scale up process over the next couple of years. All of this is possible uh, because of the team that we've assembled around uh, this this process and technology, and that really all started with uh, Dr. Gibbons and Dr. Brown, who are our, our co-chief scientific officers, focusing on the biological processing as well as the fish and animal nutrition um, around our, our product. Um, we've added to that Dr. Jason Bootsma, who's our chief technology officer. He has a significant amount of experience in engineering and scale-up of biological processes and uh, worked specifically in the ethanol industry for a number of years. We've rounded out the scientific team with a uh, pretty robust startup management team that includes uh, finance, legal, operations, business development, etc. We really look to um, complement the technical team with, again, a good, strong uh, startup business management to help move the company forward into commercialization. I'll just touch briefly on, on our current capabilities because I know uh, Bill talked about this in the previous slides uh, with some of the pictures of our pilot scale facility. This is a, a basic floor plan and I, I know it's very small, um, but the majority of the facility, our, our pilot scale operation, is um, in that upper kind of north half of the building, which is all the production and feed manufacturing area. So this is where all of the production of our product is currently happening. And we do have the capabilities of, um, of generating a, a final feed uh, in this plan as well. And then down towards the bottom right corner is where our aquaculture systems are set up. And uh, Mike might be able to talk a little bit more about this, but um, we have a number of uh, warm and cold water recirculating aquaculture systems that are set up here in our ag tech facility that allow us to do internal testing in multiple species of our current product. So we can test it internally before we send it out for external trials with partners. And then finally, uh, some of our current company milestone, milestones. Again, uh, we've reached pilot scale uh, plant operation with capacity of about a one ton production of ingredient per day. Um, we have feeding trials in, in multiple aquaculture species and looking towards uh, purchase or offtake agreements um, for products coming out of our first commercial plant. We're currently working on a capital raise and uh, development and construction of that first commercial plant, which would uh, we hope to finalize in 2015. And again, that would be the 15,000 metric ton uh, annually of product. And then we've got a strong research and development pipeline that, that we continue to work on, uh, looking at upgrading other plant-based meals and oils um, just to, to generate new product development out of our process. And with, 
that, I think we can open it up for any questions at this point. Okay, so let me do this. I'm going to change the screens one more time. So if you're uh, typing a question, bear with me for just a moment. Let's pop this up. Okay, so now our chat box is over to the uh, to the to the right side, and so uh, please uh, take a minute and uh, enter your questions. And I've got a couple of questions of my own, um, so I'm going to go ahead and start. It looks like uh, we've got a, one, our first question here. Um, so, and I'll, um, I'm going to, this looks like it may be directed towards you, Bill, or Mike. Um, are there some uh, particular fish types that cannot use your product due to uh, digestion issues? So, uh, it looks like, for example, trout. Uh, this is Mike. Uh, yeah, we, we try products in, in trout primarily with, with Shasta strain at this point. We'll be doing some work with Innistrain and McConaughey's uh, early next year. Uh, and then we'll also be doing some coho and Atlantic salmon work with, with the products. But in terms of digestibility and uh, with the, the Shasta strain, uh, those are very comparable. We're above 90% protein energy digestibility. The next question from Max. Hi, Max. Uh, or, organic aquatic feeds. Uh, yeah, the, the, the potential is there, but you know, sourcing the the uh, the commodity that's of organic origin would be the primary issue there. Okay, so our next question, uh, you briefly mentioned development of oil products. Anything like LC Omega-3 oils? Yeah, this is Bill, um, if you can hear me okay. We we're, we're actually have a SBIR project right now on Omega-3 oil production from uh, some of the byproducts of, uh, of egg processing, soybean and corn processing. So. That's definitely an interest of ours and uh, had some pretty exciting um, results to this point, but it's still at the uh, at the bench scale. So that's that's an ongoing interest. As you probably know, Jeff, omega-3 oils or fish oil is actually even more expensive than fish meal in a lot of markets. So uh, that's that's why it's of interest to us. Um, okay, so I'm kind of scanning through this next question um, from uh, Rick. Um, we'll be using the zeolite in a, a, a tilapia aquaculture operation. Um, I don't know if there's a, a question there, gentlemen. Um, Mary Beth? Um, okay, so I'll jump down to the next one. Uh, what's your price per ton for the feed? Bill, do you want to go ahead and take this one as well? Me? That this is Bill. Well, we we've been you know looking at at fish meal prices, and as Mike mentioned, our product um, in in the first generation performed equally. We're actually seeing some better performance uh, than than we do with fish meal, and our product is is extremely high digestibility. So in a recirculating aquaculture system. There's going to be some additional value in terms of less nutrients in the water to treat because more of that, more of that feed ends up in animal uh, in animal tissue and not in the water. So we actually think we have a, a product that should be priced um, at a premium to fish meal, uh, but that's a discussion point we're looking at right now. Is is where is that optimum uh, price point for our tar our our, our product? Uh, you know, right now we're working with pretty low value feedstocks and uh, soybean meal is, you know, 350 to $400 a ton, distiller's grain, two, 250 a ton, canola meal probably in between there someplace. So there's a lot of opportunity to, uh, that we think to make a profit, but uh, we are sensitive to, you know, the issue of getting our product into the market, having consumers be happy with the product. Um, but again, this is this is not a product that is uh, that's best value just on a protein per ton dollars per ton of protein basis. We we're thinking more in terms of 
dollars per ton of digestible protein because you know you can throw a lot of protein at fish but if they don't absorb it you just have to treat it on the other end and it costs you money instead of gaining you uh, gaining you money okay thank you for that so uh, next question are uh, lysine and methionine uh, profiles adequate yeah, depending on the species, the uh, the total sulfurs are not not complete or not where they need to be to you know supply those essential amino acids. So uh, we've done done some trials looking at uh, lysine and methionine uh, individually and and combined plus some other amino acids that that appear to be limiting. Um, so to be direct to your question, yeah, they're they're not adequate, but we do see. Uh, a bump in some of those essential amino acids, particularly those necessary for growth um, as a result of the single cell protein. We're also seeing some taurine and sulfonic acid uh, bump in, in the, the products. Okay, the uh, next question, it looks like uh, just for clarification from uh, Jeff, trout can use the product? Yes. Uh, we, don't, we don't know what the, the, the maximum inclusion rate, uh, rate would be. I don't know if we can do 100% replacement, but we'll have an answer to that in a few months. Okay, thank you for that. So it looks like I've got some uh, clarification from uh, Rick. Um, he says that uh, zeolite will be used to control amino acid levels in water and um, air um, convert amino acid nitrates. Uh, this is being done in collaboration with the uh, gray water systems of uh, Denver, Colorado. So uh, zeolite um, should be considered in these operations. Uh, General, do you have a, a comment on that? Mike, any, uh, you could yeah, probably yeah, be up here. Well, yeah, so he's talking about the fish, not the feed ingredient processing. Um, yeah, uh, well, uh, we're, we're running uh, recirculating systems that are running about 98% oh, efficiency um, without going into all the details on how the systems are configured. Um, yeah, any 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 improvements in water quality that we can get um, would would be great. I've used zeolite before, uh, you know, as a substrate, but uh, uh, right now we're just using the fluidized beds uh, with silica sand and then then uh, biomedia. I see, Mike, that Rick uh, is just sending a little new note down at the bottom about using zeolite in, in, as part of the feed ingredient. Have you ever done any of that? Uh, no, I've not, not used it in, as a feed additive. It must be at a low level as a, a binder or produce a, maybe a better floating pellet. I'm not sure how it performs in extrusion. Okay, uh, next question um, from Dan. It looks like uh, he's curious, are you looking for additional uh, commercial fish farms to test or evaluate uh, your product? Quick answer would be yes. Quick answer would be yes. <laughs> uh, potentially, we've got, uh, you know, upcoming trials on coho and Atlantic salmon, rainbow trout. Um, currently got have trials on uh, yellowtail cobia and totawaba. Some marine species, so uh, it, uh, uh, my best answer is it depends. Okay, a good answer there. Uh, Dan, if you want to, uh, if you'll stick around, when we get to the very end, I've, I'll have my email address popped up, and I can uh, forward you, uh, you can email me, and I can forward you uh, contact information for, uh, for Mike and for, uh, for Bill. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a couple of my own questions. Um, and these are kind of more generic. I'm an ag economist, so I'm thinking more about the actual tech transfer process. 
And uh, Mary Beth, uh, you can uh, you can definitely chime in on this one. Um, so, what has been the uh, kind of the tech transfer startup process with the South Dakota State University? What's that been like for uh, for you all? And and Bill and Mike, you might also have uh, some feedback on this. Sorry, having some technical difficulties unmuting my speaker here. Um, I guess just to give a little bit more background on how Prairie Aquatech got started, um, both Bill and Mike are uh, university professors at South Dakota State University, the, and that's where the technology was originally developed. Um, an invention disclosure form went through SDSU's tech transfer office, and uh, Innovation Partners, which is an early stage venture capital firm, works very, very closely with the SDSU Tech Transfer Office to identify and commercialize new technologies. Innovation Partners' focus is, again, on, on seed stage or very early stage technologies, looking at areas in, in agriculture, engineer technologies, and life sciences. And again, we, um, we then license technologies from the tech transfer office and then build a company around them, which is uh, exactly what we did with, with Prairie Aquatech. And we initiated the company um, by submitting some uh, early small business innovative research grants through USDA and, and NSF and um, have been very successful with the uh, SBIR grant process for the company. Um, with that, as I mentioned a little bit in the team section, um, Innovation Partners tries to pull the uh, business management team around the startup technology team uh, to really give a, a full, well-rounded um, company management to continue to um, optimize and scale up the technology and um, build a, a commercializable company. Um, so that's just kind of the basics of how Innovation Partners works with Tech Transfer. Um, Bill or Mike, do you have any comments about your experience from uh, the university side or the technology development? Well, I can I can jump in. Uh, you know, we're very lucky here to have Innovation Partners. I think uh, on our campus uh, to help help university researchers do this. Uh, as Mary Beth described, they, they basically bring all the, the pieces that you need to help uh, start up a company along with, with the knowledge of, of how to go about doing that. Uh, I don't know if, if I'd speak for Mike, but I think we'd probably both say that we would have been lost without having a group like this to you know hold our hands and, and kind of help lead us through, um, lead us through this process. You know, we have day jobs as we like to, to joke that uh, with students and advising and teaching and everything else and working with innovation partners we have the flexibility to you know basically kind of spend as much time as we want working on this on this effort um, and not overburden ourselves in terms of time commitments uh, I know some people, some colleagues at other universities that, for example, have you know taken sabbaticals for a couple of years and basically devoted their entire lives to trying to become the CEO and the CFO and everything else of their companies and 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 haven't had real great success doing that because you know they they weren't trained in that area. So that's what I've found is real value is we can participate with the strength that we have and not have to become the expert in financing or how to talk financing and all those other things. But the other thing is it is very interesting to me, I think to Mike too, to learn about the business world from this perspective. Now we're part of it, we don't have to lead those discussions, but but I learn a lot every time I'm with uh, the Innovation Partners team or meeting potential investors or meeting potential customers, how this all works. Um, the other thing that's, that's pretty neat is we've been able to uh, include a lot of our students, current students and former students, getting them involved in the company. And so having a local you know, company in a, in a relatively small town like Brookings where a student can, can get a job in microbiology is really pretty pretty interesting and I think Mike would probably say the same thing on the aquaculture side with his students.
Okay, well, thank you for that. So uh, I've got one more question for you, and if uh, and after that, if we don't have any questions, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this up. So can can you all expand just a little bit on what your most immediate need is versus are regarding the uh, the kind of the scaling up process? Do you need uh, industry feedback, um, some sort of additional funding? What are what are your what's kind of the next step for you with the uh, with the scale up process? Do you want to take a crack at that first, Mary Beth? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and start on that. Um, it, you know, I guess our, our most immediate uh, need or focus at this point is our current capital raise for our first small commercial plant. Um, it, that being said, you know, I think we're we're always looking at process optimization and uh, market validation for our current product line. That information is really helpful for us when we're out doing that capital raise and talking with potential customers or potential investors. They, they want to know um, how our process is working and, and the testing results that we're getting from our fish feeding trials. So that part is, is always important and um, you know, activities that, that need to happen uh, concurrently to allow us to to go out there and, and raise the capital needed for our first commercial plant. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so it looks like uh, Rick has put a little bit more information on here to uh, to to process. So it looks like there's some contact information. I'll uh, I'll leave that up there. Um, so if uh, at this point, if we don't have any other questions, is there a, a Bill, Mike, a Mary Beth, any uh, any kind of parting thoughts, any last last bit of uh, information you wanna you wanna just put out there? Well, I just say thanks to you again, John. This has been uh, interesting, and uh, looks like we have a pretty diverse diverse group of people out there. I see Laura Tu's name pop down there. I, uh, Mike and I spent. Uh, two weeks this summer with Laura over in China visiting some different aquaculture facilities. So I, I never did get a thank you for sending out all the pictures, Laura, but uh, that was great. So appreciate that. And again, appreciate, John, uh, you setting this up for us. I see there is one more one more question down. Max just emailed. Yeah, the, the product we produce is, is uh, a fish meal replacement. So just like fish meal would be used to manufacture a final feed, we substitute our product for fish meal at up to 100% replacement, and then have uh, additional ingredients, you know, binders and, th and vitamins, minerals, stuff like that that they normally put into the the fish pellets uh, go on top of that product, and then it gets extruded into the final fish feed product. So we're producing an ingredient comparable, we in fact think is better than fish meal. Okay, looks like uh, Max has got uh, one more kind of follow-up. So the yeah, diets still diets. need uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and, and, and yeah, Mike yeah. mentioned Mike right mentioned now we're right supplementing now we're with supplement. lysine and methionine. Um, one of the things that we're looking at with our organisms, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, <clears throat> the microbes themselves produce protein and they vary in amino acid composition. So we are looking at at being able to tweak the amino acid profile of our final ingredient by adjusting the organism or combination of organisms that we use in the process. Uh, and we're, we're, we're thinking that we will be able to reduce the supplementation levels of lysine, methionine. Uh, ideally, we'd be able to completely eliminate that. Uh, but, it, but we need to do a little bit more work with the organisms to get them to crank out higher levels of those two amino acids. Yeah, it's okay, uh, ideally we would. Oh, go ahead. Ideally, we'd like to do this, you know, uh, biologically, so we can minimize the the supplementation with crystallines. But you know, at this point, we are supplementing, uh, but we do see uh, different degrees of lysine methionine production with uh, the various microbes.
Okay, well, I think uh, that's going to wrap up our, uh, our presentation. So uh, I've got a couple of poll questions that have uh, popped up there. Uh, I'd also, I also want to thank uh, Bill, Mike, uh, Mary Beth. Thank you so much for uh, participating. And uh, to the audience that's uh, still sticking around, thank you for, uh, for your participation. Uh, I'm going to uh, have a re link for this recording available. And so if you'd like that, I've got my email address up there. Um, you can also visit the uh, NCRCRD, the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development webpage. Uh, we've got some, uh, some other webinars also posted if you're interested in the uh, kind of the technology transfer process. But with that, we'll go ahead and, uh, and wrap this up. Thank you again. Thanks, John. Yep, thanks for me too, and uh, Godspeed, everyone. Hope you all have a good rest of your week. Thanks, thanks again for the participation.